Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Staring into the Abyss. I am your host, horror author James Hershey Jr., and with me, as always, my co-host, old boy James Ash. How you doing, brother? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. How is everybody tonight? On tonight's episode, we're going to go through an article that is very interesting. It's kind of got a cool little interesting spin on the paranormal. And the title of this article is Rabies, Horrifying Symptoms, Inspired Folk Tales of Humans That Turned Into Werewolves, Vampires, and Other Monsters. It was published October 29th, 2019, and it was written by Jessica Wang from the University of British Columbia. In 1855, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle reported on the gruesome murder of a bride by her new husband. The story came from the French countryside, where the woman's parents had initially prevented the couple's engagement on account of the strangeness of conduct she observed in the young man, although he otherwise was a most eligible match. The parents eventually consented, and the marriage took place. Shortly after, the newlyweds withdrew to consummate their bond. Fearful shrieks came from their quarters. People quickly arrived to find the poor girl in the agonies of death, her bosom torn open and lacerated in a most horrible manner, and the wretched husband in a fit of raving madness and covered with blood, having actually devoured a portion of the unfortunate girl's breasts. The bride died a short time later. Her husband, after a most violent resistance, also expired. What could have caused this horrifying incident? It was then recollected, in answer to searching questions by a physician, that the groom had previously been bitten by a strange dog. The passage of madness from dog to human seemed like the only possible reason for the grisly turn of events. The Eagle described the episode matter-of-factly as a sad and distressing case of hydrophobia or in today's parlance, rabies. But the account read like a gothic horror story. It was essentially a werewolf narrative. The mad dog's bite caused a hideous metamorphosis, which transformed its human victim into a nefarious monster whose vicious sexual impulses led to obscene and loathsome violence. My new book, Mad Dogs and Other New Yorkers, Rabies, Medicine, and Society in an American Metropolis, 1840-1920, to 1920, explores the hidden meanings behind the ways people talked about rabies. Variants of the rabid groom story had been told and retold in English language newspapers in North America since at least the beginning of the 18th century, and they continued to appear as late as the 1890s. The Eagle's account was, in essence, a folk tale about mad dogs and the thin dividing line between human and animal. Rabies created fear because it was a disease that seemed able to turn people into raging beasts. The historian Eugen Weber once observed that a French peasant in the 19th century feared, above all wolves, mad dogs, and fire. Canine madness, or the disease that we know today as rabies, conjured up the canine terrors that have formed the stuff of nightmares for centuries. Other infectious diseases, including cholera, typhoid, and diphtheria, killed far more people in the 19th and early 20th centuries. The cry of mad dog nonetheless sparked an immediate sense of terror, because a simple dog bite could mean a protracted ordeal of grueling symptoms, followed by certain death. Modern medicine knows that rabies is caused by a virus. Once it enters the body, it travels to the brain via the nervous system. The typical lag time of weeks or months between initial exposure and onset of symptoms mean that rabies is no longer a death sentence. If a patient quickly receives injections of immune antibodies and vaccines, in order to build immunity soon after encountering a suspect animal. Though it's rare for people to die of rabies in the US, the disease still kills tens of thousands of people globally every year. According to 19th century sources, after an incubation period of between four and 12 weeks, 
Symptoms might start with a vague sense of agitation or restlessness. They then progress to the racking spasmodic episodes characteristic of rabies, along with sleeplessness, excitability, feverishness, rapid pulse, drooling, and labored breathing. Victims not infrequently exhibited hallucinations or other mental disruptions as well. Efforts to mitigate violent outbursts with drugs often failed, and physicians could then do little more than stand by and bear witness. Final release came only after the disease ran its inevitably fatal course, usually over a period of two to four days. Even today, rabies remains essentially incurable once clinical signs appear. Centuries ago, the loss of bodily control and rationality triggered by rabies seemed like an assault on victims' basic humanity. From a real dreaded disease transmitted by animals emerged spine-tingling visions of supernatural forces that transferred malevolent animals, powers, and turned people into monsters. 19th century American accounts never invoked the supernatural directly, but descriptions of symptoms indicated unspoken assumptions about how the disease transmitted the biting animal's essence to the suffering human. Newspapers frequently described those who contracted rabies from dog bites as barking and snarling like dogs, while cat bite victims scratched and spat. Hallucinations, respiratory spasms, and out-of-control convulsions produce fearful impressions of the rabid animal's evil imprint. Traditional preventative measures also showed how Americans quietly assumed a blurred boundary between humanity and animality. Folk remedies held that dog bite victims could protect themselves from rabies by killing the dog that had already bitten them, or applying the offending dog's hair to the wound, or by cutting off its tail. Such preventatives implied a need to cut an invisible supernatural tie between a dangerous animal and its human prey. Sometimes the disease left eerie traces. When a Brooklynite died from rabies in 1886, the New York Herald recorded a freakish occurrence. Within minutes after the man's last breath, the bluish ring on his hand, the mark of the Newfoundland fatal bite, disappeared. Only death broke the mad dog's pernicious hold. It's possible that along with werewolves, vampire stories also originated from rabies. Physician Juan Gomez Alonso has pointed out a resonance between vampirism and rabies in the hair-raising symptoms of the disease, the distorted sounds, exaggerated facial appearances, restlessness, and sometimes wild and aggressive behaviors that made sufferers seem more monstrous than human. Extreme oversensitivity to stimuli, which set off the torturous spasmodic episodes associated with rabies, could have a particularly strange effect. A glance at a mirror might set off a violent response in a chilling parallel with the living dead vampire's inability to cast a reflection. Moreover, in different Eastern European folkloric traditions, vampires turned themselves not into bats, but into wolves or dogs, the key vectors of rabies. So as aspiring werewolves, vampires, and other haunts take to the streets for Halloween, Remember that beneath the annual ritual of candy and costume fun lie the darker recesses of the imagination. Here animals, disease, and fear intermingle, and monsters materialize at the crossover point between animality and humanity. Cave Kanem, beware the dog. And that is the end of this article. So you can see by hearing the article why it caught my eye and why I found it not only interesting, but newsworthy, something worth being put on the show. Because the essential theory here is that the vampires and the werewolves from all of the legends and the folklore were actually people that were suffering from rabies. That's the theory that this lady is putting forth. She uses a lot of the symptoms of rabies to match up with 
the behaviors of the particular creature she's talking about at the moment as a way to prove that. It's a very, very interesting idea. It's an interesting theory. Does it hold water? Is what was said in this article true? Those are the questions that we have to tangle with tonight and try to figure out. I think probably a little bit. I don't think every folklore and every legend and every witness account is the result of rabies. But I think it's a combination of a whole lot of different things. I think some of the cases could have been rabies. That makes sense. It's possible. I think some of it could be invented stories and superstition. That's also probably true. But I believe that there's some that aren't going to be able to be explained. And in that small number lies the true crux of the question. It's the meat of the thing. Did vampires or do vampires ever exist or exist now? Did werewolves ever exist and do they exist now? Those are the questions that we really need to answer before we deal with anything else. Now, as far as vampires go, you have biblical evidence of vampires. If you listen to the show that we did called What Are Demons and Where Do They Come From? I go through the origin of giants and vampires and the Greek gods and mythology, all that stuff is handled in that episode. So if you haven't heard it, go on back and listen to it after this and you can get a hell of a lot of good information that shows you the origin of vampires in the Bible. You also have a lot of different stories about vampires that have been passed down and you have a lot of folklore and you have a lot of actual documentation of people digging up graves pounding a stake through the heart of the vampire and cutting off its head now in those documents they state that they know that the person was a vampire because their nails continued to grow, their hair continued to grow, and they had blood trickling out of their mouth. The stake in the heart thing is to keep them pinned to the coffin so they can't get back out. That's what that was for. And the cutting off the head is the way that you actually kill a vampire, according to the folklore. So is that evidence that those people that they dug up were vampires? In and of itself, no, I don't believe it is. Because after you die, your nails do continue to grow for, for a while. Your hair also continues to grow for a while. The blood trickling out of the mouth could be caused by bloating and decomposition of the organs inside the body. The bloating occurs because of the gases inside the body cause everything to swell. You mix that with the decomposition of organs and the amount of blood and liquid that's already in the body. And that swelling is going to push that liquid out through the mouth, through the nose, through the eyes, through the ears, through the anus, through every opening that you have. There will be a reddish brown liquid that will be coming out. So all of those signs that they gave of vampires are all easily explained by science. So does that mean that those people that they dug up were not vampires? Once again, in and of itself, no, it doesn't prove that at all. The symptoms don't prove it. The fact that their hair and nails were growing, all that doesn't prove anything. But when you couple that with all the witness reports, who knows? Now, are the witness reports reliable? Some are, some aren't. It all depends on who gave them. And that's the same thing as today. It's exactly the same. Whenever you get witness reports about a sighting of a creature like Bigfoot or aliens or, or whatever, the credibility of that report most times rely 
on the credibility of the person that is reporting it. You had all sorts of people that reported vampires. They ranged from farmers and peasants to criminals to respected clergy and governors. So it kind of ran the gamut of society. Everybody was represented in the, in the witness reports. So did vampires ever actually exist? To that question, I would answer yes, I believe they did. Because the Bible talks about them. It talks about the giants. It talks about the fallen angels. The angels that came from heaven to mate with human women. And the only way they could do so was by taking on a human form. And the only way to take on a human form was to drink the blood of a human because the blood contains the life force. Now I covered all of that from Genesis 6, the book of Enoch, and all over the Bible. I covered all of that stuff in the What Are Demons and Where Do They Come From episode on the YouTube channel. And I'm not going to get back into all of it right now because that was a whole hour show. But I believe vampires did exist. Were they what modern man and woman think of as vampire? I don't believe they sparkled like in Twilight. I don't believe they wore cloaks and covered up their face and said, I want to suck your blood. I don't believe any of that. That's nonsense. But that's not what the folklore says. That's what Hollywood says. That's what authors that have written books about vampires say. That's not what the folklore says. That's not what the witness reports or any of the stories say. So I believe they did exist. Do they still exist? Well, if they did exist before, and we know that the original vampires were fallen angels that drank the blood of humans to have a human form, then the answer to that question would be yes, they still exist. They're still around. Because those angels would still be here. They're immortal. They don't die. So, yes, they still exist. But they are not what you think of as a vampire. Now, werewolves. Do werewolves exist? Is that a real thing? Or is it complete hogwash? Well, you have a lot of folklore and legends about werewolves. You have a lot of creatures that fall into that category as well. One of which is Dogman. Another one is Skinwalkers. And Shapeshifters. All three could be werewolves. Is there any evidence that werewolves exist or ever did exist? To that, once again, I would say yes, there is quite a bit of evidence, actually. Everybody's heard of the witch trials, but not everybody has heard of the werewolf trials. Now, I did an entire show on this years ago. I don't remember what it was called. I think it's like Legend of the Werewolf or something like that. It'll be on the channel. It has werewolf in the title where I go through the werewolf witch trials. Okay, these were trials that were held all throughout Europe where not only witches were tried and convicted and killed, but also people were convicted of being a werewolf. Tested, confirmed, and killed. Put to death. There were also people that were charged with being a werewolf but the evidence did not prove them to be a werewolf, so they were let go. Those trials happened all throughout Europe, and there is documentation to prove it. All you have to do is go look it up. So to the question, did werewolves ever exist, I would say probably yes, they did. But once again, I don't think that they're what you think of when you think of a werewolf. 
Is it a person that's normal? And then when the full moon comes out, changes into a wolf? Probably not. Once again, that's something of fantasy. That's probably not the reality. More likely, it's something like a skinwalker. A skinwalker is essentially a witch. They're a medicine man that practices dark magic. And they enchant the skin of a wolf. And they put on that skin to take the form of a wolf. Now, they are not actually a werewolf. They are an evil person wearing the skin of a wolf. But it causes a hallucination when people look at you. It's a psychic impression that it leaves in your mind that makes you see a werewolf, even though it's not actually a werewolf standing there. It's just a dude with a wolf skin on. But that is what a skinwalker is. It could be something like that. It could be a shifter. It could be something like Dogman, where it's always that. It's not like it changes from human to that. It's always that. That might be out there. It might exist. There are photographs and video of things that look a hell of a lot like a werewolf that some people claim are werewolves and some people claim are dogmen. So it very well could exist. There is documentation. People did believe that werewolves existed in the past. And not only did they believe it, but they literally put people to death because of it. So there had to be some sort of evidence to prove it. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. These are the same people that were having the witch trials. So if there's some kind of evidence to prove it, how good could that evidence possibly be? Because remember, these are the people that were killing witches. Why is that so far-fetched? You can't tell me that none of the people that were killed in the witch trials all over the world, that none of them were witches. You can't tell me that. You can't tell me that witches don't exist, that they're a made-up thing, because I know they're not. Wicca is a real religion. There are real witches that practice that art. They do magic. They do spells. It exists. So it only stands to reason that they killed some of them in the witch trials. Now, was every person killed in the witch trials an actual witch? To that, I would say there's very little chance that that's true. I guarantee you there were not only a few, but probably the majority of people that were put to death in the witch trials were innocent because they were people that the other witches or the people that were accused of being witches said, oh, this guy is too, or this woman is too, because they were being tortured. So I'm sure there were a lot of innocent people that got killed. But I'm also as sure that there were real witches that were killed as well. So our werewolves real that one I would have to say probably yes exactly what they are that's up for debate but do they exist I would say probably yes in some form do I believe they go from human to wolf when the moon comes up no I don't I don't believe that at all that's based on a couple of old stories of old folklore it's not something that I believe is actual reality. Most likely, if werewolves exist, I believe either A, they exist in the form of a skinwalker, somebody who is using magic to appear to be a wolf, or B, they're always a werewolf. There is no transformation that takes place. These people always are werewolves. And I think that might be what Dogman is. There's a hell of a big similarity there. So could rabies be the reason people thought this stuff was real? 
Maybe. Rabies is a weird-ass disease, man. I've said before on this show, and I will say it right now, that I believe if a zombie apocalypse ever actually happens, the number one suspect for the cause of it will be some mutated form of rabies. Because it fits all the symptoms. You go crazy. You bite people. You have ravenous hunger. You foam at the mouth. You are afraid of water. People don't know that about rabies. When you get rabies, water terrifies you. The reason for that is because it causes a constriction of the throat and a foaming of the mouth. So you don't swallow very well. So you're afraid of water because it will drown you if you try to take a drink. That's part of the disease as well. It's kind of interesting how zombies never go into the water. Like they stay away from the water in the majority of the, of the tales of them. Some of the cases of people that they thought were vampires very well may have been people that had rabies. Some of the cases of people that they believe to be werewolves may have had rabies. Or they may have had that other disease. I'm not sure what the name of it is off the top of my head. But there is an actual disease that makes you appear to look like a werewolf. They, that famous, uh, the famous freak show and circus performers from Mexico had it. And it, they literally look like the Lon Chaney Wolfman. Because they grow hair all over their face and all over their body. That also could be a reason why people believed that werewolves were a much bigger thing than they actually were in reality. So, yes, I believe vampires did exist in the past and still do. And yes, I believe werewolves very well could have existed in the past. Because there is documentation backing that up in the werewolf witch trials. Do I believe werewolves still exist today? Probably, yeah. Because we're having all kinds of sightings today of Dogman. And I believe Dogman might be a werewolf. The description of the two are very similar. So if Dogman is actually a werewolf, then yes, they're still around. And we're having sightings today of them. So that's my verdict on it. I'm going to throw over to Old Boy and get his opinion and see what he has to say. Thank you, brother. Well, the first thing we'll do is we'll get into the rabies thing, and then I'll get into the vampires and the werewolves and all that in a minute. Do I believe rabies exist? Yes. I've seen it on TV, and I've, I used to live in Pennsylvania. I've seen raccoons that had rabies. They were dead, but they had been killed. And uh, because of it, and I've seen what they look like, and I've read the stories, and they said some people went crazy, and you know, in the 1800s, that they would get bit by something like a, you know, anything, a rabies, you know, a, a raccoon it usually has a raccoon or a dog or a cat will get bit by something that has it, a rat or or they eat something that has it. It's easy; it passes through different animals. So remember that, guys. So, and then they'll bite a human and the human goes crazy after a while. And, you know, it's very painful anyway, because um, if you get rabies, it's pain in the ass to get rid of. They got to shoot you in the stomach with all these needles and it's not too fun, the treatment um, too. So just remember that. Now, getting into the, the whole thing that he was just talking about, the rabies, he believes that might be the, the zombies. That's it's see the difference between zombies that zombies came back from the dead they were dead and they came back to life i don't believe that will ever happen now what he was saying was the 28 days later where there was an actual disease that turned people rabid like 28 weeks later too this the, the sequel i believe that um you've seen it with some sense of that uh bath salt people go crazy and do crazy stuff. I believe that could happen. It, it, it has. 
in the past. So I believe that could happen one day. And that's something you don't want because those things were coming at people. And they weren't dead. They were just sick people. And they would, they had so much rage to just beat you to death and kill you. They didn't eat you. Now, Crazies was another movie like that. was made by Jordan Romero. Either you went crazy or you just died. And you went crazy and murdered people for no reason. It was just some kind of weird disease that was in the air. And like he said, most zombies movies, unless you've seen like Walking Dead, you know, they're walking in the water. They're already dead, though. They came back from the dead. That's different than the uh, um, plague zombies. That's a whole different thing. You would say those are plague. They're not even zombies. There were people who just turned rabid. It's a whole different thing than, you know, the Walking Dead. That's a, that's why I said they should change. Zombies are like, they're because they're zombies. You gotta remember, you could be, they used that blowfish, and a lot of people who did voodoo had put people under that, and they would be slaves. So a zombie doesn't have to be dead. It could be living. It just does whatever somebody told. It's happened. The guy was buried, and he came, they, they dug him up, and they drugged him, and then they made him a slave, and he got away 13 years later, and he showed up back at his house. So that's a whole different thing. These are my opinion, you would say, like, the crazy thing. They're more, like, rabid, rabid zombies. That's what I would say, or plague zombies. They're just lost control of all humanity, and they just want to kill you. But I do, that has happened. I believe that will happen one day. That is going to happen. Those movies are right on, because that's probably what's going to happen. Probably not as extreme, but it's going to happen. So, don't be surprised one day you see that. Now, getting into the whole werewolf and vampire thing. We'll start off with werewolves. Do I believe that werewolves existed? Yes, I do. And it's not because, you know, like Dogman, I believe, like he was saying, I think it's just a werewolf all the time. It's a werewolf. But I think shape shifters are, are different because they can change into other things, not just werewolves. Even uh, skinwalkers could do this. They could turn into bears. They didn't just turn into werewolves. So I don't think it's... I think they can do it, but I think they turn into all kinds of different things. So I think they're different. I think werewolves, I think that people had that disease too, uh, where they look like they're werewolves. I forget the name. Lichens, right, lichen throat disease. And it was it's something else. I can't say the name of it, but they would get the hair and people thought they were werewolves. And those people actually have that. And then there's people who thought they were werewolves. And they would try to attack people. They've even killed people. And it's happened. And it's just in their head. But do I think that actually they turn from a werewolf like the movies say? No. I think that was exaggerated. I think there's some truth to that. Because remember, there's truth to every story, you guys. Now, they say that the devil's curse was what happened. It got cursed by the devil. Because think about the, you know, the mark in the hand. Some had a, a pentagram. So they would they were cursed by the devil. So that's what some of the folklore was said, you know, but like I said, I don't believe it. That's Hollywood and their exaggerations to make you watch stuff. But remember there's always truth in some stories. So I do believe werewolves did exist. Do they exist? Now there's a possibility Dogman might be one. You know, they see a lot of sightings of this thing, man. And it's could be a possibility. Do I think that the wolf man runs around and goes from a human to a man? Probably not. I think there's probably, like I said, it might be a skinwalker. It might be something. And they just getting it mistaked. But it might, it's not impossible. The whole vampire thing is a whole different story. I believe vampires exist, existed. I had a friend who was told me, he's like James, a Christian, and told me that vampires existed. And he was all into God, and he believed this stuff to the fullest, that they existed. And like James said, they, they're from the fallen, the angels that fell from heaven and fell in love with women. They could, that, that's where they came. And they don't look like, and maybe they do now. Maybe, we might be wrong about this. They, have, they might have been evolving. Throughout time, they've if they've lived this long, they might have evolved. Not sparkling like Twilight. I don't even want to talk about that movie. That's not a horror. That's not a 
a vampire movie to me. That was to make money. Um, Dracula, I believe he got some basis off of that. And he did. He did get some basis because Vad was a real, and his dad were real people. They did some really crazy things, and, and that's why they they got the, he, he used that for his Dracula story. Now, I used to listen to Art Bell. I know you all got it. You all did. Who listens to this? Majority of you guys know who Art Bell or listen to him. Any the late Art, great Art Bell. He had this guy who used to come on. His name was Father Malachi, and he was recognized by the Catholic Church. I don't know if I got his name right, but he even said that he has dealt with vampires, werewolves, which is everything you can imagine. They do. They just don't want anybody to know that the Vatican doesn't want people to know the truth. Like I said, people are going to get mad, but that's just what he said. And he said he used to deal with, with vampires. And they existed. And there was this place they found in a basement. They found these vampire kits. And it had everything in it. The cross and everything. And yes, people thought they came back from, you know, in the dead. So they would put stake them so they couldn't get out of the ground or cut their heads off or... Um, and then put crosses around them. And then they got the whole thing of putting garlic on it. Because they didn't like garlic. I don't know where that came from. Because I guess gar garlic's pure uh, pure herb maybe. That's the only thing. I never really understood the whole garlic one. That's one thing. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. They just don't like garlic or something. Maybe we can fill it and figure out what that was about. The holy water thing. I understood that one. Or you got you threw it on the body. And it supposedly burned it. Because people. You know the nails that grow. Your hair grows. People don't realize that doesn't stop growing. When you die. So that's all going to grow. till your body falls apart. Unless you get cremated. Some people are going to do that. So you, it won't matter anyway. But I believe they exist. I believe Hollywood. Found out. I believe a lot of stuff in Hollywood. Reacts to real life. It gets exaggerated. And I've always thought this. This isn't just stuff that just gets made up in somebody's head. There's always truth. We know people in Hollywood have told us stories about a lot of stories are real. Now they have been exaggerated so you would like them and heroes and comic books and stuff that have been exaggerated and there is a lot of non-truth in that. But there's always some truth in every story. Remember that, guys. There's some basis to the truth. So do I believe these the vampires exist? Yes. I have a difference of opinion I think that there's been sightings of these things. I don't know what the, exactly what they are, but you know, James has a, his a thing about it, and that could be. It would make a lot of sense because they drink the blood of the living. So it make it makes it makes a lot of sense to what he was saying a couple minutes ago. So yes, I do believe they exist. I believe werewolves exist. I believe a lot of these things exist. We talk about. 90% of the stuff we talk about, I believe it. Now, there's some stuff I don't believe. You know, a lot of the stuff what people say, I think people want to get on TV and they want to be famous. They want their 15 minutes of fame. So, so if they did see something, they add to it. Like they saw it running by. Oh, it was nine feet tall. And it, it, it looked at me. It probably didn't because they were so scared. It just, whatever it was, ran by them. So they figured, you know, people got to see at night you're not going to see a shadow. So the shadow makes it look bigger than it really is. It makes you alternate to what the truth is. So remember that, guys. You're never going to know the fool is that how big these things Because a lot of people think these things are seven, eight, nine feet tall. There's eight, ten different versions of them. Some people think the government made Dogman or some version of Dogman. A lot of people have their opinions of what Dogman is. There's different ver uh, species of Dogman. The hyena one. There's, there's, if, there's all kinds of stuff about this thing. So that's a whole. When we've done stories too, you can go look at on our sh on, a, on the on the channel, and you'll see we've done other shows about Dogman and werewolves and the werewolf trial. Um, we did that one a while ago too. That was a good one in the witch trial too. Witches, we don't even need to get in there. We think we know about witches. They existed. They still exist. So yes, I do believe werewolves exist. So for that being said, there you go, James. I think that maybe garlic had a couple different uses. We know garlic has 
antibacterial, antiviral, and even an antibiotic properties. Also, it is a very strong smelling plant. So if you look at a dead person, which is what a vampire would be, especially in that time period where that comes from, these are people that they were digging up their graves because they believed that those people were coming back and feeding on the living. Dead people stink. The process of decomposition creates and emits several different gases that are rather foul smelling. So putting garlic around the neck of the vampire might serve the purpose of covering up that smell. Plus, if it was rabies that caused it, then they would know that garlic had an antiviral component to it. Because people back then understood and knew way more about natural medicine than most people do today. Because they didn't have big pharma cranking out pills. When they got sick, they had to know what plants in nature they could use to heal themselves. So they would have known that garlic had antiviral properties. So that kind of makes sense as well. But I think that's what that might be. That, to me, explains garlic. As far as the church and Father Malachi, the church does have priests who go out and do these things. We have one on our team who is our exorcist. He is sanctioned and ordained by the church to perform exorcisms, cast out demons, and fight and do battle spiritually and physically if necessary with all sorts of evil things. So when Old Boy said that the church has people that actively seek out and fight these things, he's right, they do. That is true. Now the majority of the cases that those people go on are going to be possession cases. Demonic attachments and possessions. Possessions are extremely rare. Hollywood have, would have you believe that every time there's a demon involved in something, you're going to be possessed. That's just not the case. The overwhelming majority of demonic cases are all attachments. Once in a blue moon, you might have a, a possession. But it's not a very common thing. You might see a couple in your life. Usually, they're attaching. So that is also true. So if you have the church saying that there's all sorts of different creatures like that, you have legal documents from the period stating that vampires, werewolves, witches are real. People being tried for it. You have extensive amounts of folklore that back it up. And you have extensive amounts of witness accounts from the past and the present that back it up. So I would say the chances are pretty damn good that it's a real thing. Old Boy also brought up the origin of the Dracula story. 
he began talking a little bit about Vlad Dracul or Vlad the Impaler. That's where the Dracula name comes from. Because Vlad Dracul was Vlad the Impaler's father. In that language, if you want to say the son of Dracul, you say Dracula. That's how you say the son of is by adding ah at the end. So Dracula is simply the son of Dracul. They called him Dracul, not because that was his name. His name was Vlad Tepish. Dracul was the order of the dragon. That's the crest he had. That's the military unit he was part of was the order of the dragon. That was his order. That's where that comes from, the Dracula. His actual name was Vlad Tepish. And he did drink blood. He dipped his bread in blood and ate it. He ate the flesh of human beings. He also made entire forest of impaled bodies. He was a very, very interesting and very intense person. But the time he lived in was very intense. He was constantly fighting off people that were trying to kill him and take his kingdom. There was a whole bunch of enemies surrounding him. We did an episode on Vlad the Impaler called The Real Dracula, I think. That's on the channel as well. In that episode, I give a complete history of the actual man. I think I went like 40, 45 minutes just on the history part of it. And you will learn more about Vlad the Impaler than you ever thought you would know. I go through his entire life and I detail out every single thing for you. It's all backed up by history. You can look it all up and it, you, it'll match. So if you have not listened to that show yet, do yourself a favor. Go to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash James Hershey Jr. And find that show. It is one of the best shows that we've ever done, as far as the history show goes. I gave more information in that show than I've ever seen on any other show about Vlad the Impaler, TV or radio. You will learn a great deal from that show. We have done multiple shows that relate to the topic tonight. We did the What Are Demons and Where Do They Come From. In that show, I give the origin story of vampires. We did a show called The Origin of Monsters that's on the channel. In that show, I gave the origin story of giants. I gave the origin story of vampires again. I gave the origin story of all of the different monsters out there. That was also a really cool show. When you actually research and study these things, you will find out that there are more things that actually exist than you ever would have imagined. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've went into my research thinking in my head there's no way that this is true it, it can't be true it's not real it's just dumb it's silly it doesn't make any sense this can't be a real thing but i never dismiss anything without checking and once i start researching it i'll start seeing these little nuggets of truth and i'll pluck them out of all the different books and the different texts and everything that I'm looking at. And I'll kind of make a list over here on the side of all the true things. 
as that list grows, I start to see connections between the different items. I start to see similarities in different stories. By the end of it, not only do I believe that whatever it is I was researching that I thought was so silly before is not silly at all and actually exists, but by the end of it, I've reached a point where I would be comfortable taking that to trial. Okay, if I was a lawyer, I would believe I had enough evidence to convict. That's how overwhelming the evidence for some of these things are. Now, granted, a lot of it's circumstantial, but when you put it all together, it paints one hell of a picture. So in closing, before I throw back over to Old Boy for his shout outs, allow me to say, Never dismiss something just because you think it sounds outlandish or silly or stupid or made up. Because I have learned in my life that when I go into research and investigation with a preconceived notion of what the end result is going to be, I am almost never right. But when I keep an open mind and I just go where the evidence leads me, I always end up with a right and true answer. And a lot of times it shocks me what I found. So with that being said, I'm going to throw back over to Old Boy so he can do his shout outs. Thank you, brother. And that's so true. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Remember that, guys. Never always research everything. That's what's going on. A lot of people ain't researching a lot of things and they just assume things or they see something on TV and they think it's it's just true. But I want to give a shout out to everybody on Parax Radio. I'm glad you guys joined us for this weekend. It's almost summertime, guys, so get ready. Hopefully we can get everything back to normal one day. <laughs> so um, you guys want to check us out on and listen to our other shows, subscribe to James Hershey's YouTube page. Um, you want to get any merchandise, he, uh, he'll tell you where to go and get shirts and all kinds of other cool stuff. I'm glad you guys were listening to us, man. For almost three and a half years, we've been talking about all this stuff, Ver werewolves, UFOs, rabies, everything you can imagine of when we've talked about it. And we're going to keep doing it. Even when we're dead, you can still listen to our shows. We'll always be on YouTube. So you'll hear us for the rest for eternity. Hopefully they're playing this on a satellite because I know they did some other, maybe some other worlds listening to us. You never know. That would be awesome. But, you know, people are like, what the hell? But, you know, so I hope everybody has a good night. Misfit, sugar, lady, sugar ladies, monster hunters and demon lovers. I love you. Blessed be and have a great night. The YouTube channel is youtube.com slash James Hershey Jr. There is an abundance of amazing information there. Every episode that we've ever done of Tales from the Abyss and Staring into the Abyss is on the channel. That is where you will find all of the shows that I mentioned tonight and tons more. We did shows on the true story of the Pied Piper of Hamlet. We did shows on the Lost Colony of Roanoke. We've done shows on Atlantis. We have done some amazing shows. Every single one of them is packed to the brim full of information that the majority of people have never even heard of before. Definitely worth your time. It's 100% free. So please, by all means, go and enjoy it. While you're there, go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you want. That way you catch everything new that comes out. I've also started doing gameplays and stuff on there because I'm a big gamer guy. I love video games. So if you're into that kind of thing, there's some of that content there for you as well. I just want to say thank you to everybody listening. For those of you that have been on this journey with us since the beginning, 
Thank you very much. You have no idea how much we love you and how much your support means. You guys are awesome. For those of you who are just joining us, maybe a friend told you about the show or something. Or maybe it came up on YouTube in one of your recommended or something like that. Welcome. Please check out the other shows. There's tons of amazing, amazing information there. So to sum up, finally, just thank you. I appreciate you and I love you. And I'll see you on the next one. Until we speak to you again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. God loves you. And so do we. Bye-bye.